Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, a welcome to the cathedral on this absolutely stunning day. Thank you for taking time out from your shopping. It being Black Friday, and I suspect that that's why the parking is so crazy around here. So I do apologize if you've been struggling to find somewhere to park. Um, but you were, we're very glad that you're here in person joining us this uh, afternoon. And also, it's great to be able to welcome. I know we've got a number of people who are participating uh, via Zoom. Uh, just to say that today's session and tomorrow's will be recorded as well. So uh, all, will be, uh, all will be saved for future posterity. And Andrew Pettit, in, uh, 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 Ant Pettit in his usual way, has, it could be Andrew, uh, Ant is, has also doing a double, double whammy. So we've got many recordings of this today's event. So thanks so much for uh, for being here. Uh, I just wanted to say this is a very exciting part of a sort of a weekend of activities uh, that are going on, culminating in the graduation of our next cohort of St. Melitus Philip Bermuda students, which is happening here at the cathedral on, Friday, on Sunday afternoon at four o'clock. I think I need to have some lunch. Um, anyway, but also tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, there will be another lecture that Grace will be giving on a love in the midst of chaos, I think, isn't that the title? Something along those lines, looking at the uh, book of, uh, of Ruth in the Old Testament. Um, but uh, the way this is going to work in a minute, uh, Ant is going to come and introduce our wonderful speaker who I've just got, been getting to know over these last couple of days and uh, welcoming her to Bermuda. Um, and then she will deliver her, her address uh, and uh, then there'll be an opportunity for a question and answer afterwards. Um, if you do have a question that you would like to address to, uh, to, to Grace, I can invite you to come and stand in the middle there and uh, in front of the microphone, um, trying not to touch it, uh, if that's possible, to ask your question. Uh, that way we can hear it on the recording and, and we can also hear it from everyone there. And then at the end of that, I'll sneak over and give it a little wipe over just to make sure that everything is nice and clean and, and ready for whoever comes along next. But um, uh, I'm afraid it's a mask wearing exercise, except for those who are speaking up at the front. So I'm planning to stay here all afternoon. No, sorry. Um, but uh, before we begin, I'm just going to say a little prayer and ask for God's blessing on this time and thanks to him for his presence with us. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the gift of life. And thank you, Father, that we live in a world of constant change and transition. Uh, and in the midst of that, we know that there is someone who is stable, who knows the plans that he has, and who has got everything sorted out from beginning to end. But our experience of life is often turbulent and difficult and confusing. So we pray for us this afternoon as we think about the whole issue of transition and change um, uh, in many different spheres and areas of life. We pray your blessing upon our time, uh, that you give us understanding. We pray for Grace, our speaker, that you would bless her as she speaks and shares the things that are on her heart that you have laid upon her heart. And we pray that through this, you would enable us also to be uh, better able to move through life and all of its changes, but also better able to share about your changelessness and your love and your presence with us. So we ask all these things uh, in your name. Amen. And. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Ant, in case you're not quite sure who I am. Um, and I'm the director of St. Melitus Philip Bermuda. And part of that means that each year I have, to, I have to go to St. Melitus College in London for our affiliate sort of meetings. And each year I get to meet who the new lecturers are. And it was really lovely this year to finally, because you've been doing it for a while, Grace, finally be introduced to uh, Grace Bally, who is the uh, coordinator of what's called Beginning Theology. Uh, our course that we run here it helps people to grow in their faith and to enter into ministry and sometimes new ministries. Uh, Grace does the same sort of thing uh, from with her course as well. But the one thing that's really struck me about Grace over and over again is not just that she's hugely intelligent and seems to have more qualifications uh, coming out of her than I've ever imagined doing and from such a varied range. But she's able to take really complex and difficult uh, issues and put them in language that even I can understand. Uh, I would also say that one of the things that we're really passionate about at St. Melitus Affiliate Bermuda is not just 
um, churchy things, but making those connections between uh, the sort of the, the life that we all lead together as believers and non-believers and people who are exploring all sorts of things and making those connections um, between what we feel, what we understand and what everybody else understands. There is more that connects us than that which divides us. And I'm very grateful to Grace for speaking today on a, a matter that I know is close to her heart. Uh, it ought to be. She's been doing a doctorate in it for six years. Um, but also something I know will connect with many folk, maybe not just here, but also uh, out there in business land. So God bless you all. And thank you very much, Grace. May I welcome you to the, to the stage. Thank you, Bishop Nick and Canon Ant for that lovely uh, introduction. It's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, I'm really excited, as uh, Ant has said, about this topic. Um, and um, my background, in fact, in industry, I worked, or I am still working in secular space in business as a change manager. So I've been doing change management, HR, for over 20 years. Um, and the doctorate is about merging what I've learned in the secular space with the spiritual space. So just hold on to your seats as we go through the whole concept of change and transition. So what I'm going to be doing is unpacking some models for you that are well known in change and transition used by businesses, organizations, and hospitals, and so on. And then we're going to try and make a bridge and go across into how we can use this in our everyday lives from a spiritual sense as well. So that's what I will be doing with you. And first of all, we need to think about the word transition then, don't we? So in the business sense, um, transition is all about the process of changing from one state to another state, from one condition to another condition. So you can be in a place that's called position A, but then all of a sudden you have to move across to position B. That's a transition. And as we, are, as we find ourselves in transition, it's change, isn't it? And nobody likes change. Everybody hates change. We're very comfortable with the status quo. But we've seen in recent times, um, for example, the pandemic that has forced people to change, change the way we behave, change the way we think, even change the way we eat, because produce is not always available, especially at the start of the pandemic. And we found ourselves, especially as a church and organizations, in a place of transition. And in the business sense, a guy called Thomas Gilmore defines this as all the stages required from recognizing the need for a successor to putting the new leader in place. So in the business sense, transitional leadership is about bringing along the organization with you into times of change that they find themselves in. It's about succession leadership, succession planning. And leadership transition in the business sense can also mean the phases of change that the leader may personally find themselves in. And in the last 18 months, we've heard this word resilience, haven't we? Have you come across that? I know certainly in the UK, resilient, resilience has been the buzzword and gets to a point where it becomes so annoying, everything is about resilience, you know? And resilience is really about that person affected by change, being able to cope with change. And leaders in the business have found that they've had to do resilience training. They've passed it down to their, their, their middle management. You need to be resilient because the coworkers, they need to be resilient. And this word resilience is about tension and being able to manage tension that you find yourselves in. But what about the ecclesial sense? What about the church? Well, Gail 
Gail Irwin, 2017, notes this and says that as the generations boom, so you know we have generations, the younger generations, we've got Generation Z, we've got the millennials and so on. But as they boom, a wave of clergy retirements is taking place. So this present generation that has been leading is finding that as the, gener the younger generations are growing and they're booming and they're coming into their 20s and their 30s and 40s, clergy might be retiring or they might have to face a new reality, a new way of doing things. Because the younger generations want to come in and they want to lead. They want to grow. They want to use their giftings. And we're finding that in the church. But not all clergy want to retire. That's another matter. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Irwin, girl Irwin argues as retiring ministers may be stepping down willingly or reluctantly they are not retired in their giftings. And so if there's any clergy here, what I'm saying is that clergy are not retiring from their giftings, they're just retiring from the way they might be doing those giftings. And they, they, they then find themselves in a transitional state. It is vital to give, to give these ministers to give people in ministry, to give lay ministry, another outlet to function in their gifting. And one way of doing this might be mentoring, discipling others, the generations that are booming in front of them. Michael Clark, 2007 says that he sees this as the transferring of the prophetic mantle as metaphors, these are metaphors to him, representing spiritual authority being passed down from one generation to another to ensure the continu continuity of the faith. So we see two different spectrums of transition. Some of you might be familiar with the change curve. I love the change curve. Um, and the change curve is a popular and powerful model that's been used to understand the, the stages of personal transition and organizational transition. It was originally based on five stages developed by a lady called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1969. And Elizabeth was looking at the personal transition that patients go through when they deal with debilitating diseases. And since then, this model has been developed, redeveloped and presented to form stages that people go through when they respond to change. For example, change in the form of life choices, marriages, deaths, divorce, losing a job, illness, bereavement, or just simply pandemics. And for example, congregations can experience bouts of grief or joy when the vicar changes, when the incumbent changes. There may be joy and laughter or there may be tears and sorrow. And I'm sure we want to see the former. So using the pandemic as an example, I'd like to just quickly run you, run you through a typical approach for change. This is what businesses tend to use. You can see in the first, uh, right at the top of the curve is denial. Now denial, shock, numbness, disbelief, this is a stage uh, that begins with change first. When we are told about change, we tend to find ourselves in this place. Now, notice that all the stages are not definitely, sorry, all the stages don't necessarily happen 
incrementally. They can all be taking place at the very same time. And if I take you back to the 23rd of March, 2020, how I dealt with change, when Boris Johnson, Mr. Johnson said that everyone had to stay at home until further notice. The supermarkets were half empty. The shelves were missing vital, vital products like toilet rolls. There was no pasta and it seemed like the world was caving in and either a UFO was coming to take us all or Jesus Christ was coming in his second coming. And that was such of the fear that was being felt at the time. There was a sense of eeriness. I remember that so clearly. You know, I personally was scared because I had never seen anything like this. The streets were totally empty. And for a long time, I was in denial. And in the first few weeks, I would wake up every morning and think that it was all a bad dream. And stage two is anger, fear, acting up. This is where we see the arguments and the erratic behavior, withdrawal. And at that time, and I'm sure you can relate to this, cases in mental health doubled, they multiplied. We saw in the UK suicides on the increase. A friend of mine who is a psychotherapist said to me that at the start of lockdown, she told me so many people were phoning her, emailing her, calling her. They were terrified and her diary was booked up for the next three months. Stage three is about bargaining. This is the stage after you've, you've gone through the shock, you're, you're, you've gone through the denial, you've gone through all the anger and the fear. Why is this happening? This is when you start to bargain. And bargaining, they say that this is about blaming yourself. Could I have done anything to prevent this? Is this God's judgment? Is this our sin? Um, is, this, is this our wrongdoing? We start to blame others. After you've blamed yourself, you might be blaming others. Oh, it's the government's fault. Oh, it's that country's fault. They started it and so on. And we witnessed in 2020 and 2021, so many illnesses and deaths because of COVID in our families. And so we were finding ways to bargain, even prayer. Prayer is bargaining in this sense, seeking God's face, asking God for forgiveness. Is it the church? Is it something the church didn't do? That was a way of bargaining according to this model. And the last, the last, sorry, the last two, the last three, depression. This is called the valley of despair. And if you look at the diagram, you see that there's a dip in the middle, right? That's called the valley of despair. This is where you're not able to take control of your emotions um, and your mood ends up being low. You lack energy and withdraw. Stage five, this is when we come out of depression and we are accepting the change. We've accepted the, the transition and we're now letting go of anger. We're accepting to live or work in the new situation, the new reality that we find ourselves with COVID-19 as my example. People stop focusing on the, on, on the way they've done things and now they've accepted that we're gonna be wearing masks. We have to sit two rows apart, two meters apart. We have to wash our hands. We have to use antibacterial uh, gel and so on. It's a new reality. The last one is commitment. This is where the changes are integrated. A renewed individual. They are engaging with conversations about the future now. This is the way we do things. This is the way we're gonna run church. 
This is the way we're going to do our business. This is the way we're going to communicate. And so it's easy to forget the conflict of emotions that people go through. Why is this important? Because if we know what people are going through, when change happens, we will start to look at our solutions very differently. We will start to communicate very differently. Slide four is another model. William Bridges describes three phases in transition model. Um, he describes, first of all, when change is introduced, it's an ending. It's an ending of that person's reality. It's an ending of the way they've done things before. And we need to bear in mind that when people come to an ending of change, they're going through all those emotions and responses that we saw in the change curve. They're going through that shock, denial, anger, and so on. And during this time, we go from the normal state of emotions into the negative emotions, just like, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the change curve. And you can see in the middle, the neutral zone. The neutral zone is where we confront the change. And in this place, as leaders, we need an approach to confront the change. Because if we are not ready to confront the change, those that we lead will find it very difficult to cope with their own change. This is where we ask the questions. This is where we are frustrated. We may be confused with what's happening. Our productivity might be low at this stage, but there is that tension going on. And you can see there is that dip in the valley as well. And in the final phase, new beginnings, this is where we accept the change. We come into the new beginnings, a new reality, a new transition. We face the future with the new normal. And one more model I'm going to quickly go through is John Cotter. John Cotter is a famous, well-known change management guru. And he came up with eight steps. And he said in his eight steps, if you want to make a change, if you wanna deal with transition, if you want to get out of the valley of despair, these are the things that you need to do in the organization. And as I'm, we're looking at these steps, if you are a church leader, if you are leading a group, these are the things that I want you to bear in mind. So quickly, he says, first of all, establish a sense of urgency. Establish a sense of urgency. Remember that people are responding to change in different ways, but the easiest way to introduce change, the easiest way to deal with transition is to bring people together. We want to get that community spirit. And so there has to be a sense of urgency that we need to change because we're dealing with culture and culture doesn't like change. So you're establishing a sense of urgency by bringing people, key people, influencers, to talk about why we need to do things differently. Secondly, he says, create a guiding coalition. This is a group of people, the influencers, you know, the powerful people in the church that can influence others, the powerful people in the organization. You know, they might be the ones that criticize your vision, but they're really powerful people because if you can win them over, they will influence others to come on board. So your Cotter says, create that uh, guiding correlation, develop the vision. Develop the vision, not on your own. Now you might have a vision, but bring others along with you because then they will feel that they own it. And as people feel that they own something, that they're responsible, responsible for something, they will walk with you. He says, communicate the vision, communicate, 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 empower, Empower, uh, sorry, let me just empower, empower broad-based action. So as, you're, as you've communicated the vision, empower individuals to do something. Give them a project to do. Give them responsibility and they'll get on with it. They'll also feel that they own it. 
generate short-term wins. Now, change takes time. Um, change takes a long period of time. So don't try and do everything all at once. Do short-term projects that will create wins. Because you know what? If you succeed in a short project, it might be a food, food, food program. That's a small program, isn't it? As part of your vision for the new reality. Make sure that that program succeeds because those who are receiving or watching, when they see that it's successful, they start to buy in more into the vision, okay? Um, never let up, keep going, don't give up. You know, it, it, is, it is a journey. It's like walking up a mountain. It's always harder to walk up a mountain than it is, than it is to come down, but don't give up. And then finally, incorporate change into the culture. Now, number eight is vital. This is where we always go wrong because culture eats strategy for breakfast. I love this statement by Peter Drucker. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can come up with the best ideas, but if the culture doesn't match the new reality that you're trying to create as part of transition, people will not change. That is the challenge, right? People will not change. So it's really important that we address culture. How can we deal with these layers? Culture is like an onion, right? An onion, when you peel, back an onion, it has many layers. And that's what happens with culture. If you want to discover what culture is in an organization, you will spend time peeling back those layers. And the culture of your organization always determines the success of your change, regardless of how effective your strategy might be. And quickly, I'm gonna to touch on this. Um, Three dimensions of culture. What is culture? Culture is basically the way we do things here. We've always done it this way. We've always spoken like that. We've always picked things up in a certain way. We've always dressed, the priest always dresses in a particular way. He's robed in a particular way. You know, we always do the communion in a certain method because it's tradition. That is the culture of the church. And this definition has three, three principles. Firstly, formal ideas and worldviews. A worldview is basically what you believe. That forms your culture. Cultures are filled with ideas and beliefs. Um, for example, a culture can be described as Christian or secular. Our Christian worldview is that we believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ died for us and he rose again and so on. That is our broad Christian worldview. But guess what? The, the, the secular world also has a worldview. And so we are seeing all these different tensions of culture in our workplaces and in our churches and so on. That's what we're dealing with when we come into transition. Number two, we're also dealing with precognitive and unarticulated assumptions. What does that mean, Grace? That's basically the things that we see. Imagine an iceberg. You can see the very tip of an iceberg, can't you? I think it's something like 5%, but you can't see the 95% of the iceberg that's under the waterline. And so that 95% is our mindset, our faith, the things that we can't see, our, our presuppositions, the way we've been raised, our, our religion, our faith, you know, the, the way uh, we've been taught by tradition. These are things that are presupposed. They are precognitive. We don't know that they're there, but they're there. Sometimes you don't know why you, you do what you do or why you bake your chicken in a particular way. It's because you've been taught that way over time. So culture has a particular odor. You know, when you go into a room 
um, and it's full of smoke, cigarette smoke. You come out of that room and everyone else can smell the smoke on you and they think that you've been smoking, but you can't actually smell the smoke. That's culture. You don't know why you do what you do, but you do it anyway. And thirdly, in the final one, sorry, the final one is um, around culture is social and physical dimensions of life. These are our institutions, the symbols that we see, for example, in the church, the symbols in the workplace, you know, the, the way we behave, for example, in the, the, the coffee machine uh, is a great way for colleagues to come together and really find out what's happening in the organization. That is their practice. And we see practice the way we do things also in the church. And so without realizing it, culture is our default position by which we live and interact with the world. And so when we introduce change, we're actually introducing a new culture. And with all these complexities of change, i.e. the different states of transition, the variety of responses to change, the ramifications of culture, embedding change that is making it stick, seems impossible, doesn't it? But it's not impossible. So how can a spiritual framework help us as change makers? What will that do for us as church leaders, as people involved with people, we, we want to redirect the church to God's culture. As Christian HR practitioners, leaders, business leaders who want to shift the organization from one reality to another, we are to ensure we focus on the welfare of those who are experiencing the change. That's what those more, that's what we can learn from those models that we've saw previously. Focusing on the welfare, the well being, and the wholeness of the individual. We can find such wholeness by adopting the relational aspects of God as Trinity. I'm going to explain what you see on the screen in a moment. So don't worry about these big words. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is not three gods, but one God and his personhood. The Trinity is also known as the Godhead. And so I'm sure you're gonna be pleased. I'm not going to be explaining Trinitarian theology to you today. We haven't got time anyway, but rather I'm here to share what we can learn from God as Trinity when it comes to change and transition. You know, when I look at this symbol, it speaks to me firstly of wholeness. This symbol is used to symbolize the Trinity. And it speaks to me of wholeness, of participation. They are interconnected. So there's an interconnectedness in God. There is community, they are one. They are united. A theologian called Jürgen Moltmann said this, or rather his work points to the Godhead's relationship in a perichoretic and collegial approach. Perichoresis, the first word you see there, is the basic notion that all three persons of the Trinity mutually share in the life of the others, so that none is isolated or detached from the actions of the others. And here we see participation, communal and relational aspects of the Trinity. Kenosis, this is where we see each divine person empties themselves of self. Yes. They empty themselves of ego. Yes just to elevate the others. And the dynamic within the life of God lies at the heart of the Trinitarian relations. It is the ultimate expression of selfless love. And if we think about 
where we find kenosis in the Bible. Philippians chapter two, verse seven says this. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He took the humble position. He gave up his powers. And some scholars suggest that as God is chaotic, 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 so too should God's people be chaotic in their mission towards each other, letting go, emptying ourselves of self. Wholeness is also about being body, soul, and spirit, being whole as individuals. And so in a nutshell, you've got inclusivity, community, we've got freedom. This is really all speaking about how we work with each other, a community, one. So we are looking, no matter what the change, the transition is, we are looking for a community. We are looking to find out what's going on in the community and we want the community to be themselves. We want to see that freedom, that freedom to feel free, no matter what diverse backgrounds you come from, you are free within this community to express yourself. You are free to be included in what is going on, whether that's participating in the vision of the organization or whether that's participating in the, the leadership, the, the decision-making that's going on within um, a Christian church, sorry, Christian organization or the church. So I'm gonna skip that because of time, that slide, and I'm going to get you to the last slide or the penultimate slide that talks about this wholeness concept, this tripartite approach, body, soul, and spirit. And you can see in the middle, the leader. Think of that as the person who's leading the change or leading the transition. Stage one, the spirit talks about connection. This is about taking time as a leader to be still. This is starting to find out, God, what are you saying in this time of transition? this time of change, listening and hearing God. Some call this practicing the presence of God. And it's brought on by fellowship with him. It's brought on by intercession. It's brought on by spiritual direction and guidance, taking time to spend time with whatever inspires you. Yeah, making the connection. The conviction is about having a clear understanding of who we are through direct intimacy with God. Banks and Ledbetter say this. They say that the more we know ourselves through God is the more our leadership will be balanced and effective. They call this a democratic understanding of leadership. So we're starting with commitment, conviction, on connection. And if I link that back to John Cotter's model of change, he starts with this establishing a sense of urgency, bringing people together, getting, creating a guiding coalition. This is the place where we make the connection with each other, yeah, the community. Stage two, the mind, this is adaptation dealing with the attitudes and behaviors. And remember the change curve where you had all the different emotions and responses? This is about responding as a leader to those emotions and those responses that people go through when they have to deal with change. But as a leader, you are mentally preparing yourself to adapt to change. You are being resilient or learning to be resilient. Acceptance is about accepting the new reality. This was Bridges, William Bridges, three phases of transition model that I showed you, where you had the endings, the neutral zone and new beginnings. This is about accepting that reality. You as a leader or the one leading change, once you've accepted the reality, 
others we will also be able to do the same. And stage three is the physical. This is where it happens. This is the responsibility, firstly, as a leader, taking ownership for your leadership actions, um, giving everyone a shared responsibility. Going back to the principles of the Trinity, community, inclusivity, and fellowship, we are now creating that space for, for shared responsibility so that they can own the vision and jump on board. Movement is about responding to the transition. This includes the building of relationships. For me, this is so key because this is where sometimes we do get it wrong. Building relationships. This is the discipling, the mentoring of others, the coaching. This is about impacting relationships within the community. So strong spiritual leadership is forged in the spirit, the mind, and the body. Leading with your whole self will get you better results. And in conclusion, as the change maker, lead from the place of wholeness. Wholeness and well being are paramount. A spiritual framework seeks for the well being of the person leading the change, as well as the person affected by the change. It is relational. See wholeness and well-being of the others, number two. Number three, develop key relationships. Prepare for succession if that's what's, what's part of your model. Do the mentoring, find others to mentor, find others to build up. Because as you do that, you are improving those key relationships. For both secular and sacred, this involves the training of people. This involves a new reality. This involves a new way of working. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, Grace. Good afternoon. Good to have you in Bermuda. Um, I'm Jermaine Tucker, priest at Christ Church in Devonshire. And uh, it was very striking to see that image where culture. Um, trying to remember the, the quote, quote, it eats strategy for breakfast. Um, I've often regarded myself as a change agent, but I'm noticing that I'm probably more preacher of culture than, than anyone else. What would be um, your advice to a young priest who is uh, two years in the parish, who's feeling like the change agency that used to uh, fuel him uh, is now becoming more of the same culture that uh, I've often fought against. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so very good question and, and definitely um, not one that's just peculiar to one, one place. It's a problem. Um, culture is something that, as you've, as you've said, is really hard to change. So you can bring in change and then people revert, revert back to the way they used to do things. And that's why um, I loved what John Cotter says, um, incorporate change into the culture so that people start to know that actually we're not gonna keep doing this all the time. 
we're going to keep coming up with relevant projects, relevant topics, so that they get used to having that atmosphere of change. That's number one. That young minister needs someone to walk alongside them. Um, I would suggest a really good mentoring relationship with an older, I call them olders and youngers. Someone who is mature in um, ministry, has seen what the culture exactly is and can advise that young minister. So there's a mentoring relationship going on because sometimes we want to run before we can walk. And so quite rightly, it might just require time to introduce the change, but we want to introduce it now. And so just going back to John Cotter, incremental change is really good. Incremental change is the most powerful. I read a, a book, a leadership book. I can't remember the author, but the author said, as a new incumbent, as an incumbent, a new minister, when you come into a church, don't do anything for the first one year. Because in that time, first of all, you need to understand the culture. You need to understand what your predecessor did, that the congregation loves. Um, because if you now go and undo what the predecessor did, you're in trouble. They will reject whatever you want to introduce. So find out in that year or that first six months, what's wrong, what's good, what can be improved and what needs to stop. Take your time with change. Start to build relationships with individuals. You know, it seems weird to say this as a Christian, but we really do need to know who holds the power in the church. Who are the power groups? Get to find out what makes them tick and work with them. If they are work people that you can work with to help you support your change. And I think that that's really important to be able to launch that minister for success with whatever change they want to introduce. What are the practices? What are, what are the things that are hidden under the waterline that we cannot see, that we need to understand and deal with? And I'm gonna throw it to um, Bishop Nick or Canon Ant as ministers to add anything that they would suggest. <laughs> anything to add? No? One of the struggles is that, is, is that when you think you understand what the culture is, uh, because that's what presents, uh, that's what people tell you, but actually, and people want change, but they actually don't want transformation. They don't want transition. And sometimes you think you know, but you don't know. And that's, the, the, uh, and, and that's what you bump into all the time. Is how, to br how do you bring that out? This is more of a question than a statement, but how do you bring that awareness out that this is, this is why we're doing things this way? This is what I... So coming in as a new person, sometimes you do see things. You see the way that things happen. And uh, people may be unaware that that's how things are happening. Um, but uh, it's, um, but it's, it's getting that understanding, that full understanding. And I think that's where the listening in the whole process, yeah. listening to your own prejudices, as well as listening to whatever else everyone is saying, despite their action. And when you're talking about the whole issue of culture change, it's, it's a, it's, People don't recognize their own smell, as you say, you know, the cigarette smell or whatever it happens to be, or when they come into my office, you know, it has a particular smell that I, I don't even notice, but it's there. And they walk out with it and they will either like it or they don't like it. And um, yeah, it just, but it, it's, it's dealing with what's under the surface, I think. Yeah, yep. having that awareness, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Thank you, Bishop. And what we've done in, um the workplace, so in um, the organizations I've worked with, to be able to start to tease out that culture and start to work towards change is to have focus groups. So we call them focus groups or listening groups, you know, really starting to, whatever you have observed, starting to hit those things, raise them and have a conversation and lead people on a journey where they start to identify for themselves what needs to change. I think that's the most powerful way to do change yeah. when it comes from that person or those that, that need the change. They identify it, they own it, they recognize it, 
and they want to do something about it. Yeah, amen. Does that just do, does that answer? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to just just add to that that um, I, I've been at my church for forty years now, and it, it took me twenty years to get to know everybody's name and and feel a part of the church. So I, I mean, two years is just such a short time. And I like your idea. Just just keep the vision, keep working at it, and keeping building relationships. I think that's the key. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else? Sit down, Anne, I've got a question. Um, <laughs> uh, Rev Gav, um, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. I'd like to just get your views on uh, the fact that there's secular culture and church culture, and we have this, they, they seem to be quite poles apart quite often. We, church we you know we we listen to organ music in church but when we go home and put our cd players on we don't really listen to organ music and things like that there's a real dichotomy between church culture and secular culture and yet at the same time we're and, uh, we're called as, as as priests to proclaim the gospel afresh to every generation and that generation is that secular generation or the non-church generation which is a completely different culture to our church culture and yet at the same time we know that we're called to be countercultural as a church and uh, and quite often we use that countercultural. We need to be countercultural. Therefore, that's a defence for doing the things the way we do. We do things because we are we are called to be countercultural and not about a secular culture. How do you bridge the gap? Just in you know one sentence, you know, easy easy to answer question. How do you bridge that gap between what what do we recognise as what is appropriate in terms of how we connect with secular culture and the things we can kind of di dispense with in our church culture to proclaim the gospel afresh to each generation and if you can just you know let us all know the answers that would be amazing <laughs> <laughs> thank you i'm really glad you asked that question because um, um as part of my research i did really look into culture and i think it was graham ward um who said that there are three types of culture approach that the church has of you know historically over time um i'm not going to quote him because i can't because i haven't got my notes but he was basically saying that there's three principles the first one is uh christian groups have an approach where they uh believe to move towards secular culture so they embrace secular culture so they interact with what's going on they for example we might use worship as a good example actually where we have you say the strobes <laughs> the the smoke machines um, um the particular worship style of music it's you know if somebody was uh, on the streets and you're playing something like hill song or you know the kind of sound that they can identify with because we see that also in secular music in some ways that is culture where the church is mixing with what's happening in secular but they're still standing for the truth yeah and um, they're just doing clever ways to try and draw secular in by something that they know there is another approach where you completely as in a church over time what they've done is drop their source which is the bible and they have gone and moved with the times and that is mixing culture that's mingling with the secular culture yeah the secular worldview so they may do things that might be contrary uh to what a conservative Christian or an evangelical, conservative evangelical Christian would believe, but they believe that we have to change because these are the times. If we don't change, then we become a redundant church. So there may be standards that drop. They may, the theology might change. So that's something, that's the second point. And then the third one is to be completely separate, them and us. We will do our thing in the church and you guys can do your thing. We don't even know what's going on in the world because the world is heathen. They are 
you know, they're, they're, they're sinners. Um, and we see a lot of uh, denominations as examples that have gone in that direction. The important thing is to know where do you stand in relation to the word? Is the word the source? And if the word is the source of truth for you, then the approach must be God's mission, which is God's culture. I call that God's culture. And God's culture is about redeeming the earth, redeeming his people. Um, and if we are using the word of God as our truth and our source, then that must be the place from where we are inspired by mission to reach people. And I think to answer your question, it's about um, being prayerful and being um, reflective, practicing what is right through that reflection. And it's always going to be, you're asking questions. You will always have to ask those theological questions to understand what does the Bible say about this? And how are we going to approach things? I'm definitely going to ask Canon Ant on this one because we had a conversation about this. Do you want it to respond, please? <laughs> I'm thinking of practical theology in this sense and asking those big questions. So that, I'll say again, I'm thinking about practical theology. And how we ask those questions, how do we deal with theological issues? I mean, it's always it's always the same, it, it, and my students will laugh because it always comes back to theological reflection, because um, theological reflection is not as that thing of just looking at myself and going, who am I, and, and what's you know, where am, where am I in this moment, but actually, that dynamic process of being part of something that that is changing. I, I am changing, and I put myself in a position where I expect to be changing, um, and that. Uh, that engagement is part of that, but I can't just sort of keep changing, 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 changing uh, without actually stopping and reflecting on what that might mean. And as you say, I think rooting it, sort of anchoring it in, uh, in, in the scriptures for us as Christians. And that, you know, but if, if I were a business, then I would have a set of, uh, you know, things that tell us who we are as a business, you yeah. know, um, uh, and that's, that's really important. And holding on to those, those fundamental principles is with, without them becoming fundamentalist. Uh, and then looking at what is happening. How does this uh, apply to, to what it is that we're trying to do? What actually is the goal that we're trying to achieve? And then looking at things like the, you know, the culture and the, the tradition of the, of the organization that we're part of before making a decision about actually where is the next change? And so those are sort of incremental changes, I think. Does that, does that yeah, answer what you mean? That does, thank okay. you for that. Where we go. <laughs> does that help? Hi, Grace. Hi, um, I have a question with regards to following on a bit with um, Reverend Jermaine's question in terms of, uh, you had indicated in terms of time when you're trying to change the culture, a new leader coming in and giving yourself six months to a year. How do you manage giving yourself the time versus the expectations of a group of people, be it a church, or in a secular work environment, looking to that leader to make change. And so how do you manage that, those expectations against them losing interest, walking away, walking away from the ministry, or as if they're a ministry worker? How do you manage that it is the question that I have because people get frustrated and they don't feel that you're necessarily going to bring about the change that you're hoping, that they are hoping that you would bring? Mm, that's a really good question. They're all fantastic questions. Um, and I think it goes down to, I love what you said, managing expectations. That's really it for me, would be managing expectations. So sharing the vision, you know, but sharing the vision, a loose, outline of the vision because at the end of the day you want people to come along that journey of realizing what that vision what that mission for the church or for the organization may be so saying at the outset 
that this is what I'd love to do. These are the changes that I, I would love to bring, um, but I want to get to know you. Uh, and I'm going to be doing, you know, these series of dates to get to know the organization or to get to know uh, the believers, but also at the same time, crafting, crafting out some projects and um, ideas that they can also get involved with and can also do to keep the momentum. So the momentum never drops. The momentum keeps going and people are still being active. They're still being involved, even if that means there's, you know, they're coming to you, they're, they're getting to know you, but something is, there are a series of activities going on so that people don't lose interest. But the vision I think is really, really important because people want to know what's going to happen. Should I stay? Is this a place I want to stay? Yeah, so the vision is key for me. Any other questions? Thank you very much.